hosted by Sister Bobby Gurley, and we just lift her up in the Lord tonight and thank God for her. And um, at this time, we're gonna uh, I'm going to sing a song. It's called But For The Blood, and y'all pray for me. But for the blood shed on Calvary's tree.
Lord, tonight it's so good to be in the house of the Lord, and I tell you, I wouldn't want to be in any other place tonight. It's such a privilege to be here, and I want to turn it over to Brother Lynn. He's going to sing you a good anointed song tonight, and just lift up your soul tonight, and if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, Savior, today is the day of salvation. Jesus died for you, and he loves you, and he will save your soul and set you free tonight. And right now, I'll turn it over to Brother Lynn. Praise God. God is so good to us. And I'm so thankful, Brother Bill, that any time, night or day, I can talk to Jesus. It's always, he's always on the line. And any time that you want to talk, you know, a lot of times you, you have a problems, maybe you need to talk to somebody about it, and you hard to find anybody that want to listen, you know, especially this day and time. People have so much negativity on TV, on the news and everything. No wonder... Even I, I don't like to watch the news, news no more than I have to, you know. But there's one thing about it. God paid for the plan of salvation with his only begotten son who died that may have life and have it more abundantly. And I just, tonight, if you're not living an abundant life, you know, maybe we're not exactly where we want to be. And sometimes we don't realize the abundance that we do have. You know, if you got a family, you know, that that's with you there at, at the dinner table, whatever, you know, and... You say grace over, over the food that you eat. Thank God for the house that you live in. Amen. We've got so much to be thankful for. Right. But I'm so thankful tonight to know that when God searched through heaven to find somebody that was willing to go, Jesus said, here I am, I'll go, you know. And right. I appreciate that. And, and this song's entitled, Had It Not Been. Just suppose God searched to heaven and couldn't find one willing to be the supreme sacrifice that was needed that would buy eternal life for you and me oh had it not been for man called Jesus and had it not been for the old rugged cross had it not been for a man called Jesus, then forever my soul would be lost. But I'm so glad he was willing to drink life's bitter cup. Although he prayed, Father, let it pass from me. And I'm so glad he didn't call heaven's angels to pour the nails from his hands that torment me. Oh, had it not been for man called Jesus, had it not been for the old rugged cross, had it not been for this man called Jesus, then forever my soul would be lost. Sister Bob, at this time, praise the Lord. God is so good. Your salvation's already bought and paid for you. Might as well receive that ticket tonight. Well, praise the Lord. If it hadn't have been for Jesus, where would we be tonight? Right. There's no hope 
I'm up here again without a Kleenex. <laughs> I know better than to come up here without one. But we have no hope without Jesus. How does the world ever live without Jesus? How do they live without somebody that cares about every need and every problem that we have? Uh, the church of the air is about Jesus. So we're not about the singers. And we got a very special guest tonight, Brother Buddy Reynolds. But it's not about you, Brother Buddy. It's about Jesus. So. And he knows that. Brother Buddy knows that. He'll be the first to tell you that. So. But I'm glad that he's here with us tonight. He has... The church of the air would be no church of the air without Brother Buddy. I'm here to tell you, he, he has just done all of our equipment. He's brought equipment in and would let me pay. One time I offered to pay him for some. He said, you don't have enough money to pay for it. <laughs> I said, well, I could pay it out in payment. <laughs> he said, no, and he just gave it to us. He has just blessed us so much. Aren't you glad you know people that cares about the Lord that wants to help? Uh, come on up, brother, buddy. We're just going to let him go ahead. I won't, don't want to take up his time and just go ahead and bless us with the word. Thank you, Sister Gurley. It is always an honor and a great responsibility to, to give forth the word of God because there are so many messages going forth nowadays that's without without merit of the word, you know. Amen. You can go to a church nowadays and you can hear all kind of sermons preached and you'll never hear Jesus mentioned. You can hear all kind of songs sang and they do everything they can to dodge the blood because they say it's a bloody religion. But let me tell you this, the word of God tells us without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. Hallelujah. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of our sins. He became our sacrifice. Praise the Lord. Father, we're grateful to you for the honor of bringing your word. We're humbled because of it. We need you. We need you so, so urgently. We desire you. We desire you. Lord, the television, everyone that's watching by television at this time, Lord, there's a burning desire in our heart. The reason they're watching is because they're hungry for righteousness. And they want the truth. And Father, you've somehow chosen us tonight to help present your glorious, wonderful, priceless gospel. And help us to be that, serv that servant that you want us to be in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, as I was, I was meditating and, 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 and thinking and praying about what we need, you know, sometimes, I'll, you know, I'm, I like preaching and and uh, I like being on the evangelistic side where you can get emotional and run and hoop and holler. And I mean, tell you, when the Holy Ghost hits you, you can't help but do that. But tonight I have some more, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be a little bit on the calm side, I guess. But I don't know, no of you folks out here at Church of the Air, y'all might just get me preaching and shouting anyway. <laughs> but I want to share with you some important truths that we need when we come in this hour, this day that we're living in is a time of conflict. The world is so much against Christianity. Even in our country, which I never, when I was a young child, I never could understand or see how that would be possible. But, but people in our country have lost the fear of the Lord. When you get yourself in a position, and Sister, Sister Gurley's been there a lot, you've been there a lot, and you by television, I know that you've been there several times. When you get to the place where that you are against the wall, what do you do? In, in 1 Peter 5, 5 and, 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 and 7, it says, Casting all our cares upon Him, for He cares for us. Casting all of our cares on Him. And then he goes on to talk about because your adversary, the devil. Everybody say devil. He said because your adversary, your enemy, the one that is against you, the devil, is walking about as a roaring lion, seeking those whom he may devour. But I like what the old time Pentecostal preacher said. He said, but Jesus has already kicked his teeth out. All he can do is roar. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. What do you do when you come against, when everything's coming against you 
And it seems like the answer has fleed. It seems like prayers don't get above the ceiling. What do you do? Where do you find yourself? What, 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 what's our answer? I'm here to tell you I know what the answer is. And you do too. And you by television, the answer is casting all your cares upon Him. Because giving up certainly is not the answer. Blaming Jesus is definitely not the answer. Because your enemy is not Jesus. The enemy is the devil. And he's, his whole purpose is to stop you. I was reading today. Exodus chapter 3, if, if you want to look at it, but I'm not going to read the whole thing here. Uh, I just want to kind of give you a brief a thing that was taking place, and that is that Moses, you remember after he was put in the, in the, in the basket and he floated and he ra was raised in Pharaoh's house, in the leader of Egypt's house, the time came when he saw his brethren, the Israelites, being, being beaten, mistreated, in bondage, and he began to take action. And as soon as he took action, it wasn't the Egyptians that came on him. It was his own brethren. Jesus said, I was wounded in the house of my friends. It is a hurtful thing when your own people and when I say own people, I'm not talking about necessarily those of blood. I'm talking about those of the same faith. I'm talking about brothers and sisters in Christ. And for some reason it does happen, but it's not God's fault. When, when things come against us, what do you do? Moses ran to the other side of the desert. He married his wife, and his, and his father-in-law Jethro put him in charge of watching over the flock. And he was there for many, many years. You know that. And while he was watching over the flock, he looked afar off and he saw a bush. And the bush was burning and burning and burning and the burning. I mean, we need some of that kind of wood in our fireplace, you know, that just keeps on a burning, but it don't burn up. That's a good thing about the fire of God. It'll burn everything that's not good away, and it'll keep the good and keep it forever. So he looked at that strange thing, and you know the story. He, he says, I'm going to go and see what's taking place here. Moses goes, and he looks at the bush, and the voice of the Lord begins to speak to him. And he says, take, up your, take off your shoes from your feet for the place you're standing is holy ground. And the Lord began to tell him, my people, your people, Moses, they're being persecuted. I've seen, I've heard their prayer. I've heard their prayer. I've heard their affliction. I've seen the affliction of, the, of these people. And I want you to know, you, I'm sending you forth, and you're going to bring them out of the land of Egypt. Amen? He said, you're going you're to bring them out of that land of Egypt, and you're going to be the, the deliverer. And, of course, that's not really something Moses wanted to hear. But how many of you know that when God calls you, he never forgets that calling? Amen? The gifts and callings of God was without repentance. There may be things in your life that you do. There may be failures that you, that you come upon and that you face in your life. But I'm here to tell you that still that calling is never repented of. God has that calling on your life. Don't you quit God just because you had some hard times in your life. Amen? Hallelujah. Moses had come on the scene. The Israelites were beaten 400 years. They were in, in Egypt's bondage. The Egyptians used them in hard slavery. And it got harder and harder. Now, how did they get there? How did they get to Egypt to begin with? You remember there was a, a famine in the land, and the man, and a, and a, and, a, and, and a, actually, actually, what happened? Joseph's brothers had taken him, and sold him 
And they took him to Egypt and sold Joseph on the, on the auction block. Make a long story short because we wouldn't be able to carry it, cover it all tonight. But Joseph was promoted by God in the prisons and wherever he was at until the time came that he was exalted and promoted to second in the kingdom next to Pharaoh. And because of it, the Israelites were favored by the Egyptians. Year after year, 50 years, 100 years, 200 years, 300 years, 400 years, and they were happy in Egypt because they were favored because of what happened with Joseph interpreting the dreams and having favor with God. But God said, I, don't, I didn't give you the land of Egypt. I gave you the land of Canaan. But in their heart, the, Egypt, the, the, the Israelites were happy in Egypt because they didn't have to do things hard and everything was given to them and everything was going good and they were prosperous and they had many blessings and many possessions. And they, the, the attitude came, why should we leave Egypt and possess the land of Canaan? Why should we do that? We have it made here. But God said, I promised Abraham and his seed forever another land. And it's time for you to go in. But you know what? They couldn't, they couldn't, they couldn't understand leaving the blessings that they had. You know, sometimes the church can't stand the blessings. And God has to rise up the oppressor. And that's what finally happened. Because they were blessed, they didn't want to get on the move. They didn't want to leave. But how many know that when hard times begin to come, you want to relocate? <laughs> Amen. You want, you want to find those blessings again. That's what happened. They were used to the blessings. They didn't want to leave. God rose up another Pharaoh. And here's what the Scripture says. Another Pharaoh who knew not Joseph. In other words, he didn't favor Joseph and what God had, had done with Joseph and therefore they began to lose their favor and he put the Israelites into heavy bondage and because of it they began to lose their blessings they began to lose the heritage they began to lose uh, uh, the, the prosperity that they were enjoying and they finally came to the place hey where's that place God promised Abraham we want to go there and God finally got Israel to the place they were ready to leave because at the time they were even having to make brick without even any straw. He made it hard on them, and, they, and, and the allotments had to continue to be the same. I said that to say this, that during that particular time, this is where we find Moses coming on the scene and saying, hey, and he goes to Pharaoh, and he says, Thus saith the Lord, let my people, everybody say go. It's time for them to leave here because God has a better plan for their life. The whole time he's had a better plan for their life. Pharaoh said, well, they're our slaves now. We got free labor. Why should we let them go? You know, the, you know as the word of God continues to carry on and on and on, Finally, it comes to where that the, the, the ten plagues that convinced Pharaoh to let the children of Israel go, and the tw tenth one was the death of the firstborn. The only thing that spared the firstborn was the, everybody say blood, on the doorpost. Amen. The blood of Jesus is what spares you and I. You that's watching by television, let me tell you something. There's nothing bloody about the blood of Jesus because the blood of Jesus will turn you white as snow. It'll take your sins. When I say that, here's what I mean. It'll turn your sins as though they never were. It'll take an old, dirty uh, tablet of nothing but sin, 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 and it'll make it white as snow. God will put those, those sins that you've committed, no matter what you've done, into the sea of forgetfulness, and he'll never, he chooses to never remember them again. Hallelujah. So Moses comes on the scene. He says, let my people go. The death of the firstborn after all the other plagues. And finally, Pharaoh says, take them. Just go. Now, there's a lot of stuff in between what I just said and where we're at right now, and we'll try to talk on it just a little bit as we go on into the sermon. Uh, 
But he says, go ahead and go. Take everybody, take what you want, just do what you want to do, and you go and you worship your God. Just get out of here. They start to leave. Thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people. You might look at it like this. That was a large church. And Moses was the pastor. And you think he had any grumbling people? <laughs> oh, Lord, that's another sermon for another day. The point I want to show you is that as Moses leads the children of Israel out of Egypt, they go and they go and they, and they come to a place and there's a great sea, a red sea before them. They look back and they see the Egyptian army behind them coming as fast as they can. They are in a, what we call in the south, they were in a pickle. They were in a place where you would, I would say, between a, uh, between a, a, a hard spot and, and, a, and a rock against the wall. What were they going to do? Brother, sadly, some of them said, why did we ever leave Egypt to begin with? You can never win by becoming negative. You got to remember what the promise of God is and what the promise of God was. He said, I'm going to give you a land. I'm going to give you a land. I'm going to give you a land that's flowing with milk and honey. He said, I'm going to give it to you. But some of them forgot that quick, the promise. They forgot the stripes on the back. They forgot the brick making. They forgot, they began to forget God. And they began to believe the negative. And they began to believe the word of Pharaoh. And they forgot God once, just that quick. But I'm here to tell you that God is true. Let God be true and every man be a liar. My, 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 my. They were in a hard place. What were they going to do? Now, you got to understand, as, they, as, as Moses said, stand still and see. And here's the first thing that you do when you find yourself in a corner. You stand still and see God's salvation. Stand, everybody say, stand still. You stand still and see. Moses stretched forth his hand and said, Stand still today and see the salvation of the Lord. For you see this Egyptian army behind you? Here's what he says. He said, Today, forever, you will never see them again because God's going to set us free. The waters begin to, the wind began to blow, and the waters began to part. The wind blew and dried up the ground. There was no mud between their toes. And Sister Gurley, sometimes I get to thinking, you know, you know, my imagination can really, you really go and get to thinking about some of these things. I wonder who the first one was that walked through, the, through that water. You know, I'm sure it wasn't the ones that were saying we need to go back to Egypt. Because I can hear them now, hmm, you gotta go through that water, that water fall down on me and kill me. You know, I, I can just imagine all these kind of things, but I'm here to tell you that when God parts something, it don't come back together until God puts it together. Woo! Glory to God. He said, he said, you stand still and see God's salvation. What do you do when it's really hard? What do you do when, you, when you're looking at the face of your, of your loved one and they're going into eternity? What do you do when you get a phone call? Sister Gurley, I got a phone call one night. I was over five hours away. My son was on the, on the sidewalk with a bullet in his head dying. And I said, you put the, all I had was a telephone in my hands and my son was laying there. And I, and I said, you put that phone next to his ear right now. And I began to pray for my son. And I said, Bill, I said, you give your heart and life to God right now. And they said, said that life signs began to come back to him during that time I was talking and praying over the telephone. Just a few days before, his wife told me that he, he just stood up and she thought he was a crazy man. He was watching some preacher on television just a few days before this. And she said he stood up in the middle of the house and said, I surrender. I give up. I give up. 
And she thought he was going crazy. But the preacher on the television was saying, if you don't know what to do, you need to just give up and give it over to God. And that's exactly what he was doing. And there when I talked to him and prayed for him on the phone, hallelujah, he began to have life again. And I know he heard that prayer. And I believe with all my heart his spirit was praying with me. And he made it with God. Well, oh, glory to God. What do you do when you don't know what to do? That's what you do. You stand still and you give the word of God and you'll see the salvation of the Lord. I told you I wasn't going to get emotional tonight. But brother, you can't help but get emotional when you know. So what do you do? When your son or your daughter and you're praying for them, they're going out of your grandchildren. My grandson, my, son, my, son's, my son's baby boy, Dawson, he lives with me now. And uh, been praying for him. We lose his angels. He called, me, he called me last night. No, Friday night. It was Friday night. He said, he said Papa, he said, somebody, I'm getting gasoline. Somebody, he said, three guys came up to me and put a gun in my face. And he said, a man came out of the store and took a gun and ran them off. I'm here to tell you, what do you do when, you, when you're not even around? What do you do? You trust God. 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 God will not fail you. Somebody asked me. I don't know why I'm talking about this tonight. I, I usually don't feel so free to, to share. But somebody asked me one time when my son died, said, aren't you just a little bit upset with God? Hadn't God failed you? And I said, God has never failed me. I'm not saying that because I'm some kind of great person, but he's the only one I had to hold on to. Why would I give him up then? Why would I give up God just because a member of the family dies? Why would you do that? Brother, I've started this thing a long time ago, and I ain't a quitting now. I'm not here to tell you I'm holier than thou. I'm not here to tell you I haven't failed from time to time. I haven't to hear, I'm not here to tell you I haven't committed sin even after I've been saved. But I'm here to tell you that he forgave me of all my sins. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. What do you do when the waters begin to part? Well, well, first of all, when you see the Egyptian army pressing down on you, what do you do? You stand still and you'll see God part those waters. You hold on to your faith. Everybody say faith. Somebody told me one time, Sister Gurley, they said, they said, Brother Buddy, you know, faith is hard. I said, no, 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 no. You know, what is faith? Faith is saying, I believe God. What is faith? Everybody say, I believe God. I believe God. Well, that's what faith is. How hard is it to believe? It's harder for me to believe you than it is to believe God. It's easy to have faith in God. I can believe what he said. He took me through the hard time. He, gave, he keeps me in the good time. I don't call on him only when I need him. I call on him because I love him. Those watching by television, I hadn't gone crazy, believe me. I'm just, I just holler sometimes. <laughs> I, just want, I just want you to understand. I want you to understand tonight that all you got to do is call on God and just believe in him. Hallelujah. It's not a certain formula you got to go through. You don't have to join the church of the air to be saved. All you got to say is, Father, in the name of Jesus, I believe that you're my Savior. I believe that God raised you from the dead on the third day. I believe you died for my sins and you shall be saved. It takes believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. I believe there may be someone watching by television right now. We're not through with the sermon. I'm going to continue to preach, but we're going to pray right now. If you want Jesus in your life, you need a change in your life. Church, I want you all to pray with me. Say, Father, by television, say, Father, in Jesus' name, I'm asking you to forgive me of all my sins. Come on, church, say it with me. To forgive me of all my sins. Cleanse me, Lord, of all unrighteousness. I do believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And I do believe that the Father raised him from the dead. And I confess you, Lord, as my Savior in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. You know, those of you watching by television, if you prayed that prayer tonight, 
You've been tormented. You've been in the place you don't know what to do. You're in the situation maybe you're, dr you're drug controlled and, and your people have judged you everywhere. I want to tell you something, that Jesus Christ just answered your prayer and you just surrender it all, okay? Just surrender it all because when you pray that prayer, now what you need to do because your confession is so important, you need to call somebody, you need to look up somebody, you need to tell somebody, hey, I just accepted Jesus. You say, why do I need to do that? Because you need to let, the, the, the devil needs to hear you say that because he don't own you no more. Bless God. And God can help deliver you from that dr drug addiction and from that alcohol addiction. God will help you. Hallelujah. Church, say amen. amen. All right, let me continue to preach to you. Praise the Lord. You stand still. You hold your faith. You don't live for God just because it's easy you even you live for God even when the times get hard when when they began to persecute you just like and I'm not going to get into politics I'm going to try not to get into politics tonight it's not there's nothing wrong with the church telling the truth about politics so I'm not apologizing for anything I'm just trying to, because that would take forever. But I'm trying to tell you that even when, when political people or Hollywood people come against you or sports, uh, sports heroes, nothing but gladiators nowadays, when they come against you because of your stand for God, you stand for God anyway. When a president of the United States of America, which we used to have, <laughs> who would allow a Muslim faith of people to come in and leave Christians in another country to, to, be, be, to have their heads cut off. He didn't rescue the, them. You still believe God anyway. That's, all I'm, that's where I'm going. That's it. That's it. Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Well, you won't see these Egyptians no more. Amen. Isaiah 40 and 31 says, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. How many of you tonight here in this audience right now, in this congregation, how many of you ever been in the place where it's been really hard? I'm not just talking, you know, people th say, well, my money just, I ain't talking about money at all tonight. All of us have had hard times in money, you know, but we've had some hard times. But you didn't quit God. And those of you that's watching about television, maybe you did quit God because of some hard times, but it's time for you to grow back up. Just grow up and, and, and realize it wasn't God's fault. Hallelujah. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. The Bible says that David encouraged himself. He even his men, brother, brother Bill, even his men were talking of stoning him. Why? Because he went out to fight some battles and left his people there. And while he was out fighting battles, they came in and stole the husband, and stole their, the women and the children and all their goods. And, that, and then it says, then David encouraged himself because the men talked of stoning him that David encouraged himself in the Lord, and then God said, go take after him, and you'll recover all, and not one thing will be lost. Not one thing will be lost. But if you quit in the middle, you'll lose it all. How many you know we're not losers tonight? We're not going to lose a thing. Guess what happened to Elijah? He was fed. He was fed at the brook by raven unclean thing took care of the clean man of God hallelujah Jesus fasted and the angels came Matthew 4 and 11 the, an the angels came and ministered unto him hallelujah when it gets hard you need to remember what numbers chapter 23 and verse 19 says you know what if I read it to you let me read it to you real quick God is not a man that he should lie. <laughs> Neither the Son of Man that he should repent. Hath he said, 
and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? When you find yourself in a place, in a hard place, what do you do? Brother Bill, just a few years ago, I was a young man. <laughs> many, many, many years ago. I did some mission work down in Central America, Guatemala. I was doing mission work there, and we were trying to wrap things up. It was me and Gerald Marsh and his wife. They were all, we were all from Florida at that time, Pensacola, Florida area. I was going to, going to college over there and preparing for the ministry and Gerald and, and, and his wife. We had a we were driving his van pulled in a camper, and we were doing mission work all through you know southern and Mexico and, and into Guatemala, and we were doing all kind of things that way, and we were making our plans to come back home. I got a stipend of sixty dollars a month, and I and I lived good on that at that time. I don't know what you can do with sixty dollars now, but you know at that time it was pretty good. Hallelujah. Guatemalans thought I was a, a, a rich American. $60 a month. Man. Man. Praise the Lord. But the Lord spoke to us in prophecy. And it was given to us these words. And I remember them well. The Lord said, they were praying over us, releasing us to go back home. And the Lord said, thus saith the Lord, return home. In peace. Everybody say peace. Now, Sister Gurley, I know you probably tell everybody, y'all can't see her, but Sister Gurley, that word peace means a lot to me because I'm going to tell you why. On our way back home, we crossed the Guatemalan Mexican border, beginning to go up through Oaxaca State, came into this little bitty town, and it was headed on up. Was going across this one bridge. I was driving the van. You know how a camper is. Sticks out about yay far on each side. I began to go across this bridge. And as I hit the end of the bridge, there was a man walking on the side. And the bridges down there, you, you have to know, they were real narrow. And the, when I got up closer to the man, he walked out in front of me. I, and on the other end of the the bridge, this this like a like a, a, a eighteen wheeler a transfer truck was coming my direction, and I had a choice. I could go head on to try to miss the the gentleman, or the only other choice I had was to hit the man. So after I hit the man, glass and mirrors and stuff broke. And I had come over as much as I could, and it more or less hit the side of my fender instead of the front of the thing. And when it did, it kind of knocked him out. And when it got back, when the, tr when the trailer came up, it finished hitting him and knocked him over the bridge. It knocked him so hard, he didn't land in the water. He landed in the ditch way up. And Sister Gurley, remember I told you that word, peace, meant a lot to me? I was looking for it hard. I was looking for that peace. Because the, 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 the cops came and they got us. They took our papers, our visa, passports, papers to the vehicle, and took us to, to, directly to jail. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Go straight to jail. The medics had come and they had picked the man up. Actually, I'd run down to see him and his most of his clothes was knocked off of him and uh his back was just busted open in an l shape and he couldn't move he, he only moved like this he couldn't move from his waist down and they took him off and the cops took us off and in jail we were in a holding place and of course when we'd been preaching in guatemala in south mexico we were preaching through interpreters we knew quite a bit of Spanish at that time, and 
But we didn't have enough Spanish to get us out of this kind of trouble, and I started praying. And rather than blaming God, God, you know, you, I came down here to work for you and suffer for you, and look where I'm at now. I didn't do none of that. We didn't, we didn't do none of that. There's a time you grow up and you quit blaming others or God or whoever about the situation you're in. You begin to think back like Moses said, stand still, we'll see the salvation. There's peace here. And I began to pray and said, Lord, what are we going to do? And the peace began to come in again. And when that happened, come and wait, come and wait down the hall. Sister Gertie, about twice, you see that back door back there? About twice that far, that's how long the hall was. Real narrow hall. I saw it looked like an American man coming down that hall. And he came straight to, to, to uh, me, Gerald, and, and uh, his wife. And a little bit later, I don't know, three or four minutes later, a woman came, looked, looked just like an American. They started speaking English to us, and I, was, and I told them what had happened. And they said, don't worry, we're going we're gonna to stand for you. And uh, so they went over and started talking to the jailers, come back and tell us what they were going to do. And what the first plan was, I was the driver, so I was the one at, at mistake, you know, at, 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 at uh, fault. So I told Gerald and I told his wife, I said, when y'all get back to the United States, do whatever you can to come get me out of this place. And uh, the man, the American-looking man left about that time, and she kept talking for us. And the reason I'm telling you this is because what God did for me then, I want you to know that he'll do it for you. He really did a thing that increased my walk with him so greatly. They just, by telling me, if you don't know what they did, they just held up a sign and said, I got 10 minutes to go, so I got to hurry. <laughs> These, this man had left, and he went somewhere. And she told us, she said, what you're going to do, they're gonna have, you're going to have to pay the man's doctor bills, his hospital bills. You're going to have to pay the time he's going to be off of work. You have to pay this and this and this. And, and that is if he's even alive. They're contacting the hospital now. And she said, don't worry, he's okay. I saw him. He couldn't move from his waist down. And so they called, and finally they got a hold of a doctor or somebody there at the medical center at the little hospital thing they had, and they said, we just released him. Now, I'm not shouting, but I should be. Because you should have seen me when I heard that. I went, whoo glory to God. So they released him. And just maybe 25 or 30 minutes later, he comes in down that same place, down that same corridor, he had his boss with him acting like his interpreter, and I thought he was going to kill us. He was mad as a said in. God had healed the man. He was still mad. And about the time he came in, this American-looking guy come back in. And him and his boss came up, and they went to the, they went to the jailers, and the jailers came over with him and said, you got to pay however much, I don't even know how much money it was. And as soon as he did, the American-looking guy pulled out a... a, a, a a lot of money caught, folded three ways and counted it out to him until the last dollar was gone. And he was satisfied. He left. The American man and woman look, walked with us back to the counter with a jailer. And they were getting ready to do the paperwork, processing us to get out. And they, t they said, and they, I was, he was standing right here. Gerald was here. And I'm right here. And the officers behind the counter were giving our papers back. And I said, sir... I said, if you're giving me your name and address, I'll send you the money back when we get back to the States. And there was just a peaceful smile on his face, Sister Gurley. said, that won't be necessary. He just smiled. And the jailer, just like this, and I was looking, and, and this, this is how it happened. The jailer said, here's your paper. So I went like this, and I turned back around, and they were gone, him and the woman. God had sent two angels for some reason to help me. <clears throat> He helped me. He helped Gerald and his wife. And you say, buddy, why? Why did God do it for you? A lot of people, they've had to go to the jail. They've had to, well, I don't know why God chose me to do it for, but he did. 
And I told him, I said, Lord, I'll promise you, I promise you that when I, every time I get an opportunity, I will tell the people in the, in the states what kind of advocate, judge, what kind of lawyer we have to the Father. And I'll tell them what kind of good God you are. And I'll re always remember what you did for me. That's why, Brother Bill, somebody, people ask me, do you, what, you know, what if they're really hitting the God? What if they're really hitting the heaven? Have you ever thought about that? I said, I can't think about it. God cheated. I cheated. They said, what do you mean you cheated? I, saw, I, I said, I saw God's angels. I saw His delivering power. I saw the miracles take place. I saw the skin cancers fall off. I seen the hearts put back together. I seen the miracles of God. I cheated. I don't know how some people can say, reckon they're really. And I've heard, I've had preachers to tell me that, brother, brother, buddy, do you do you think what you know? What if what we're doing is not really real? I was like, man, you you you're talking to the wrong one. And because of it, I'm able to help them because they realize what God did for one, He will do for you on television. He will do for you here in this congregation. Glory! The jailers asked us, said, where'd the people go? Of course, we, you know, like I said, we knew a little, little, little Spanish. We said, no, they were with y'all. And then the, and the jailer said, no, those people were with you. I said, we didn't know them. He said, we didn't know them. He said, but how did they get out of here? I mean, just as, just as quick. And a corridor twice that far, they were gone. Don't tell me to get, there's no angels. I believe God encamps around about. He sends his angels to encamp around about us to take care of us and deliver us. God did it, and he still does it. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> you got me to preaching now. Glory to God. What do you do? What do you do when you're a hard place? See, I can't forgive, buddy. If somebody's hurt my feelings so bad, shame on you. If you can't believe your brother who you have seen, how can you, how, how can you, how, how, how in the world can you believe in a God that you haven't seen? We got to forgive. You want to get over church troubles? Start forgiving. Start practicing what you preach. You know, too many people bring a fork to church instead of a spoon. They just fork it to this one. Oh, preacher, I'm glad the preacher said that, and they fork it to this one. And they put a fork in and give it to somebody. It's time you bring a spoon to church and spoon some of it in and grow up and be mature in God. Yeah. And I say that in love. <laughs> Hallelujah. You trust in the Lord. What do you do? You trust in the Lord. When you see your family, you know, the older I get, the more I see the obituaries. I see names in there I know now, more than I used to. And guess what? Not all of them are old people. So, young person, give your heart to God while he may be found. Another thing, let me share this with you. I'm going to go ahead and give you the points because I'm, I'm not going to have time. I got how many minutes? I got, I got almost two minutes left. Write these down. <laughs> if you don't know what to do, it's important not to compromise the promises. God promises you everything, get everything. Don't take half. Is that not what he tried to do with Moses? You go, leave the women and children here. Leave your stuff here, but you and the men can go. No, you don't compromise that. Number Next, this is important. If you don't know what to do, if you're going through a real heavy spiritual battle, remember the devil's against you. He's not for you. What you need to do is do not isolate yourself from the brethren. The Bible says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. You know why? Because Brother Bill, when I see you, it encourages me. Hallelujah. He said, well, Lord, they don't need me. No, but I need you. 
I don't need to go to church because they don't need me. No, they need you, and you need them. We encourage one another. That's why it's important for the church to get off the high horse and quit trying to be multi, uh, multimedia churches and, 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 and large churches and remember that God's on your side and you need one another. If it's only five of you getting together, God, you need one another. Hallelujah. Sister, you are your brother's keeper. You need to remember that. If you get yourself in a, in a hard place, remember, you are your brother's keeper. Well, I, mean, I don't even know him. It doesn't matter. He's your brother. She's your sister. And if they're missing, missing heaven and you have an opportunity to give it, you need to re read uh, Ezekiel chapter 3, chapter 33. If, uh, if you don't warn a righteous man of his iniquity, his, his blood will be, will be required at your hand. You are... Your brother's keeper. I've been told one minute, I can't get through in a minute. I've been told, Sister Gurley, I have been told that it's none of my business. I said, you are my business. Church of the air is your business, and they care for you. They're not raising millions of dollars here. They're, trying, they're raising what they can to bring this glorious gospel to you. That's why we come to you tonight and want God's blessing to be yours. Father, in Jesus' name, we honor you. We thank you for what you have done and what you're going to continue to do. You have honored us and blessed us, and we love you so much. People that's watching by television, people that's here tonight, Lord, we may be in a, in a hard place, but we're asking you to set us free. We have victory all around us. In the name of Jesus, amen. Hallelujah.